In this segment, we want to talk about trauma. And I want to read you something, if you don't mind, that I wrote not too long ago. Um, it's actually called This Year Alone 5,000. So it starts out talking about 5,000 young black men will kill 5,000 young black men. And then it switches it up from that kind of massive life and death trauma to regular old run-of-the-mill ordinary trauma, okay? Trauma may be, may be the most common condition in much of the African-American community. Trauma from dental pain without the money to have it relieved. The trauma of working two full-time jobs, trying to make ends meet. The trauma of knowing your children are now home alone in a dangerous neighborhood until you can arrive hours later because each work day you spend two hours on the bus traveling to and from work. The trauma of having been the victim of incest or sexual abuse by a family friend. I grew to believe that 40% of African American women live with this particular trauma, sexual abuse. And as I said earlier, some of the mental health professionals that I teach this information to tell me that it's probably 60%. How about the trauma of another child's death from just being caught in the crossfire or hit by a stray bullet at home while doing homework. It didn't take a rocket scientist, professor, or pastor to know that much of the African American community is in big trouble. Not all. All you have to do is look around our urban and poor neighborhoods to discover that crime, violence, disintegration of the family, miseducation of our children, poor nutrition, racism, discrimination, disparities in the criminal and social justice systems, unemployment, and depression have taken a terrible toll on us as an ethnic group. To make matters worse, the African American community is fracturing along class lines. The poor and the middle class see each other as two different races, even two different species. We're not willing to work together. We do not see our problems and our struggles in common. We have a me first and only my kids matter mentality that is destroying the unity. They used to insist that if one of us got a hit, we would then aid others in getting a hit. <coughs> Have you ever thought about the trauma of being unlucky enough to attend a crappy school? One that is broken, but because the district has the power to tax, never dies? A school where lots of teachers live with the trauma of being somewhere that they just don't want to be, yet need a job? A school where the adults have given up on the kids and the kids have given up on the adults? Yet the law says you must attend until you're old enough to make your own bad decision or too big for them to control you anymore. For the half of our students who do not drop out, the testing considered most valid indicates that for math and reading, African American high school seniors perform at the same level as 13-year-old white students. How's that for starting a career with trauma? How does this happen? How can it be? It happens just a little bit at a time. We adapt. Life goes on. We feel bad and try many good sounding strategies, but without a viable solution in sight, and with so many seemingly viable ones having failed, we just feel more defeated each day. Eventually, we decide it's not us because it's bigger than we can handle. We conclude that we can do little, that nothing will change, but maybe we can touch or save a single child. No, you say. Sometimes crime goes down and test scores go up. And the neighborhood isn't as bad as it used to be. Yet trauma still reigns supreme. The following sentence is from an article entitled, entitled A Matter of Black Lives, which was published in the September 2015 issue of Atlantic Magazine. Quote, from 1980 to 2013, 262,000 black males were killed in America. This is an average of 7,939 each of 33 years. Who really cares? If you do, then what are you doing about it? Do you know what to do about it? Is that the real issue? Do we just not know what to do? 
If we knew, if you knew, would you? Would you do all that you can do and all that you know to do to end the needless trauma in the African-American community? Within the African-American culture, a segment is experiencing extreme positive evolution, the best schools, the best jobs, and they are definitely building wealth. While a significant percentage within the same African-American community are actively devolving. And life simply goes on as cultural polarity expands. Just run-of-the-mill, ordinary trauma. Okay, I have in my, I hold in my hand an article that I absolutely love. It was written in 2007 or 8 by uh, then a master's in social work student by the name of Michelle M. Sotero. And when I read this article, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And it's not written within the context of cultural intergenerational trauma at all. The three words I love to string together, cultural intergenerational trauma is written in the context of what the medical profession calls historical trauma. Mm. Said another way, there is a ton of research going on right now in the strictly medical field. I'm not talking about mental health field, just physical health field, which is causing a higher and higher percentage of physicians to conclude that at the core of the vast majority of disease is stress and trauma. That the correlation is unbelievable. In terms of public health, just about all the research is going into this specific arena right now. You know, for instance, here in St. Louis, we have a young researcher who just became a full tenured professor at Washington University top 20 research university, um, who is trying to educate the community that one zip code, 63105, have a life, has a, the average person has a life expectancy 15 years longer than I think it's 63120 or something, I don't know, but in, in a lower income black community versus a higher income white community. And, you know, as they, they're saying that a lot of the differential in health relates directly to your birthright. And I'm not talking about genetics. I'm talking about your social economic status and how that impacts your life. Uh, I think 50 years from now, we're going to look back and view our lack of understanding and appreciation and knowledge for how to deal with trauma the way we look back to the 1800s and where they thought that if somebody was sick, they had bad blood, so you should cut them and get the bad blood out. <laughs> that we really are only beginning to figure this out. Now, this medical researcher, however, put together this chart. And interestingly enough to me, this chart has very little to do with physical health. It has a whole lot to do with mental health, trauma, intergenerational trauma, and cultural intergenerational trauma, okay? So she made these physical arguments, but then she does this chart to try to demonstrate it, okay? And you know what she starts with? A dominant group. I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> There's nothing in the article about a dominant group subjugating a population. But she is almost saying that historical trauma starts right there. And then she says, well, what does it look like? Well, it looks like segregation, displacement, plantation, reservation, refugee camp, etc. Next block is physical, psychological violence, acute and chronic, economic destruction, loss of resources, legal rights, cultural dispossession, Laws of cultural roles, language, religion, etc. You sound familiar? 
she, she, she never uses the word slavery anywhere in here, but didn't she just describe slavery? Yes, yeah, she did. And didn't she just describe the dispossession yeah. of Native Americans? Yep. We all stand on their shoulders, you know. And Americans committed genocide against these people solely because they could not conceive of the concept of selling God's creation. They're like, I can't say to you the land. My wife has a t-shirt. I should have a picture of it. And I, I may destroy the paraphrase just a little. It's a quote of an African chief. And here's what he said. His words, not mine. White man, I will give you as a free will offering anything that you can carry with you. And I'm thinking you can carry my wife and children with you. <laughs> but that's what he said. <laughs> okay? Really? And then he said, but I cannot sell you the land because it's not mine to sell. He said, the great spirit made me a trustee of the land. How can I sell something that I don't own? End of quote. So he said, fine, poop, you're dead. And you know, we really have to be careful because we as black people like to glamorize the Buffalo soldiers, you know? People that fought for their freedom in the Civil War, stayed in the Army. And as we were annihilating Native Americans, you know what their job was? That's why they call them Buffalo Soldiers. Their job was to kill all the Buffalo so that the Native Americans would be starved into submission. Mm -hmm. Literally. Mm -hmm. And we want to be proud of them. Ooh, Buffalo Soldiers riding horses shooting Buffalo. Okay, forgive me for that. <laughs> it's just, what group in America is in worse shape than African Americans? Really? It's Native Americans. They're a train wreck. And it's because one culture forced it upon another culture something they couldn't even conceptualize. It was so far out of the realm of reality as defined by their culture, that it literally completely demoralized them pretty much to this day. Okay, let's go back to my girlfriend here. So she says that's the first generation or primary generations. But she says, guess what? It lives on from there. And I would say it lives on from there whether anybody told you about what happened up here or not whether you forced it out of your remembrance as a culture or not. So the first thing she hits is trauma response. And that's cool, because that's how those that got it together got it together. You know, somebody in their family blessed them with resilience and protective factors that minimize the negative impact. But let's look at what she says happens for most in subsequent generations. And she's got categories here. Physical response. Nutritional stress, compromised immune system, biochemical abnormalities, endocrine impairment, adrenal maladaptation, gene impairment and expression resulting in malnutrition, diabetes, hyperglycemia, infectious disease, heart disease, hypertension, and cancer. <coughs> Sound familiar? Then she says social responses, increased suicide rate, domestic violence, Unemployment, substance abuse, child maltreatment, poverty resulting in breakdown of community family structures and social networks, loss of resources, separation from loved ones. And then she talks about psychological response. Post-traumatic stress disorder, depression. Boy, is depression common in our community. Panic and anxiety disorders resulting in Anger, aggression, social isolation, shame, loss of self-worth, trauma, fear, grief, withdrawal, and numbness. And then she says, all of that results in breakdown of community, family structures, and social networks, loss of resources, separation from loved ones. I'm sorry, I read that as part of social response, didn't I? I think she's saying, I don't know which, you know, that's a summary of the three or whether it's part of social. 
Then she says, secondary and subsequent generations. You know how long this can go on? Until somebody intercedes. I don't know if you remember, but at the end of Listen to the Ancestors, um, she said, Grandfather looked me straight in the eyes, and I, I knew that this was the final statement and the most important statement. And Grandfather said that he wanted to share the secret of life. He says it comes straight from the Creator. He said, love begets love, and evil begets evil. And love will always overcome evil when love acts too. Yet evil always acts while love often waits. Yet a life is but a moment in time without a proper name, while those we enhance our harm, enhance our harm, and enhance our harm for countless generations. And in my journey, that's the one thing that scared me to death. I did not want to be responsible for countless generations. Like, give me a break, okay? That's too heavy. Until that sister in the third retreat put the brakes anyway on incest in her family and a light bulb went off. It's true. Love will create more love just like evil will create more evil and love ain't ever lost on a battlefield with evil that it was willing to take. Yet evil doesn't take no snack breaks, no smoke breaks, no vacations, no family leave. Evil is always on the battlefield while love often waits feels inadequate, inept, whatever. Yet a life, my life, your life, anybody's life, is but a moment in time without a proper name. While those we enhance our harm, enhance our harm, and enhance our harm for countless generations or until someone intercedes. And just like that, you can stop the most negative of cycles. And you know what stops it? You brought it into the light of love. Evil cannot beat love. Impossible. Never has, never will. If evil's winning, love is on the sideline. Now, like that wasn't brilliant enough. Okay, I love this woman. I never met her. Okay? <laughs> love her. It's like she had to stick some stuff over here. You know what I'm saying? And over here it says, modes of intergenerational transmission. Psychological, genetic. Do you realize that MRI and CAT scan technology has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that a mother experiencing severe trauma during pregnancy, that that results in entire regions of her fetus's brain not developing. And one of those areas is what they call executive function. You know, the ability to have self-control and to make, you know, complex decisions. Just like the research says, and this isn't debatable, okay, this is like hard science. And it relates to the number of traumatic experiences you've had and your age when you had them. Obviously, the more being bad, but the younger age being horrific. And you know, this really bad trauma, I mean, abuse that we talk about, you should see the graph of when it happens in life. Just about all of it, I don't want to say all, because we know in cases it wasn't. But the vast majority of it happens before age seven, eight, nine, or ten. When kids aren't old enough to know what's going on and tell somebody. The rest of it is buried in a family. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make there is given, and we're not talking 50, ex, ex, you know, just a few young enough, those same regions of the brain literally shrivel and die. Documented fact. And guess what? They don't come back. They're dead, I think. Okay. Then she's got a, a cube here, okay, a three-dimensional rectangle. And boy, I wish she'd write some more articles on this. She has not written another article on this topic since 08. And she's a professor. Okay. Influences on health disparities is the title of the box. 
the arrow coming over here says intergenerational transmission. On this scale, she has life stage, life course. On this sphere, she has proximate and distal. Because as we know, it don't happen to you to be, have to happen to you for you to be traumatized by it. Over here, she has individual, an anomaly, population. Most kids buried some friend. And then up here, she has past and present. When I read this, I went, oh my goodness, somebody nailed this puppy. And I was thrilled that somebody made it that simple. And they weren't even trying. They're talking about physical health. How cool is that? Okay, now, we need to do a, a round robin if we can, okay? Um, and, you know, don't make it hard. Just open your mouth, <laughs> let it flow. But you do need to address the topic on the floor, okay? And the topic on the floor is simple. Convince me that you're beginning to understand how trauma can be transmitted from generation to generation. We always beat them. We, we always have you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cut you some slack. We're going to go to Ann first and then come this way. You'll be last. <laughs> So I'm supposed to convince you that... Well, don't take it too literally. I'm just saying, give me feedback on okay, intergenerational again. trauma. Say it again. Just whatever your thoughts and feelings are, revelations, whatever, as it relates to trauma being transmitted consciously or unconsciously from generation to generation. Because, you know, all negative mental legacies of slavery are is the intergenerational transmission of trauma. I mean, really, every example we use is that. I'm sorry, my brain, my synapses aren't firing yet. Okay. I have to forfeit my turn. <laughs> Normally that's not allowed, Ed. <laughs> uh, and I think you, I know that I know that you get it. Um, do, okay, can you see the validity in negative mill legacies of slavery? You see how it's transmitted. I see how it's transmitted. I don't see any validity in holding on to it. But you can until you're aware of it. Right. Because there's nothing to let go of until, you know, it just is. And that's what's interesting about culture, particularly when it's not explicitly defined. You just absorb it like osmosis. Okay. Let me move ahead. Hold that thought, okay? And where I want to go very quickly is I want to go to Australia, okay? Because there's another report that made me goo goo ga, -ga excited. It's called the Social Justice Report of 2008 on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, done by the Social Justice Committee of the Aborigine and Torres Strait Commission of the Australian Human Rights Commission. You got it? Now, uh, when I go like this, some researcher is being quoted in the report. When I don't go like this, I'm just quoting the report itself, okay? And, for, and, and the report is about 300 pages. It's really boring. But eight pages was like the bomb. They're defining trauma. Trauma is qualitatively different from other negative life stressors as it fundamentally shifts perceptions of reality. Healing from the wounds of such an experience requires a restitution of order and meaning to one's life. Let me say that again. Trauma is qualitatively different from other negative life stressors as it fundamentally shifts perceptions of reality. Healing from the wounds of such an experience requires a restitution of order and meaning to one's life. Uh, 
Trauma. Uh, it's coming from the bees. I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry, say that again. Coming from the bees and being mistreated and just you know, walked all over. So you got to turn around and leave that back in the past and come up out of that. You got to learn to walk away from it. You got to let your mind go from that. If you think I'm going to interrupt you, you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a roll, man. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? <laughs> okay. On that note, I think we should, on that note, I think we should take a break. Okay. And I want you to hold that thought. I want you to speak to that thought again right when we come back from break. Okay. Because I don't want to interrupt your flow. Okay.